Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another gist of the show. All right, so some more free samples from my uh, friends over at Creative Palette. Um, so I've got three wines here from the Ron Rubin Winery, and uh, I'm excited to try these. They're a wide range of prices. Not wide range, but a decent range of price points here. Nothing crazy expensive. And, um, yeah, so let's let's kind of go through a little background. Ron Rubin, um, he... Uh, he calls himself, uh, well, I guess he's the self-styled beverage guy. So in the uh, little notes, it says, when you go to the website, it says, uh, Premium Wine and Tea, Ron Rubin Brands. So uh, he, he's from the Illinois area, and uh, I don't say Chicago area, just Illinois. Illinois-based central wholesale liquor. It didn't say a city, but um, he uh, his dad was in the uh, wholesale liquor business, and... So he worked there, and then he decided to go out to California to go to UC Davis in the 70s, early 70s. But he didn't, he didn't become a winemaker. He went back and uh, uh, he went back and expanded the family business. So he started adding wines, mostly from California. And then, um, uh, then he decided, hey, man, my salespeople need to know how, how to sell the wines. So they would go to California to learn about the wines, which is awesome. And then... Um, they sold the business in 94, and by which time this beverage guy had branched out into, distribu into, into distributing over 3 million cases of clearly Canadian sparkling water. I remember drinking that back in the day uh, via his own New Age Beverages Company. In 92, uh, he ran across The Republic of Tea, a book by Mel and Patricia uh, Ziegler. Inspired, he purchased The Republic of Tea, a Larkspur, Larkspur California-based tea business almost two years later. So he owns Republic of Tea. He still owns it. In 2011, he found a, um, a winery he wanted to purchase. So he bought that purchase. Uh, he purchased River Road Family Vineyards and Winery. And uh, it's in the Green Valley AVA or the Green Valley of Russian River Valley AVA. So sub, sub, sub AVA, AVA of Russian River. Um, because it's cool and foggy thanks to the Petaluma Gap. So there's a gap to... St. Pablo Bay? Uh, I'd have to... I'll put a map up and put the bay there. Um, so there's a gap that uh, cool air and fog comes through by Petaluma in Sonoma. And that's where this all is. is and uh, brings in cool weather. So some of Sonoma is really warm and some of it's really cool. And this is a cool area. So a lot, so a decent amount of the grapes come from the estate, but they don't have enough grapes for the production that they have. So um, they do purchase from 
other uh, growers, but they really make sure that um, these are they're good quality grapes. So um, was it in this? It's not, is it in this one? Sorry. Um, there's some very important notes I want to talk about. So I think it's in the other thing. So anyway, um, he also is behind a Trained for Saving Lives, um, which is an organization that's uh, whose goal is to provide 450 California-based wineries with automated external defibrillators and train over 2,500 winery staff in CPR, AED usage, the automatic, automated external, uh, and first aid. He also started the Ron Rubin School for the Entrepreneur at Culver Academy and has taught MBA classes at St. Louis University. Uh, he's written some books. And uh, in 2017, he seed-funded a crowd-sourced app enabling the public and researchers to access UC Davis, the Maynard Amarine wine label uh, and menu collection. Um, he's also the current president of the board of, director for, board of Directors for Sonoma State University's Wine Business Institute. So, um, I mean, he's he's got a lot of stuff going on. He definitely believes in uh, supporting uh, the community. And then some other stuff that is important. So, it says, only some of the wines are identified at the state as the winery permit specifies a maximum production of 12,000 cases. And this is common in Napa and Sonoma for sure. I'm not sure about the other counties in California, but, you know, if you don't have a permit that allows you to produce a whole bunch of wine, if you hit that limit, that's it. Or you, um, he also uses a custom crush facility and partners with a larger winery nearby to bottle some of the wines. Um, he wants his wines to be inspired by Green Valley. So he, um, he will buy some fruit and he says the goal the winery works with a core group of five growers, three of whom have been selling fruit to the winery for decades. So, I mean, he wants to make sure that if he's getting um, grapes from off outside of the property, that the they're good quality grapes. Uh, the winery is both SIP, which is sustainability and practice. So SIP certified, which is the gold standard for sustainable vineyard uh, winery and wine certification. And then the certified sustainable by the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance. So um, what does that mean? So here's a list of things. Wildlife corridors to give animals access to food and water, owl boxes for pest management, cover crops, filtering winery water for reuse, solar powered and wind energy sources, and offering competitive wages, medical insurance, and education for the workers. Goals are updated every year according to challenging conditions, science, and technology. So let's do a little soapbox thing here. There's a difference between sustainable, organic, bio, and natural, and then conventional. So organic, that just means that grapes are organically grown. That's it. It doesn't mean anything about the winery. And, and trust me, I'm not trying to say that the winery isn't practicing maybe sustainable practices and all that, but if you're doing these certifications, if it's just organic grapes, that's all it means. The, the, the material is organic, but you can do whatever you want in the winery. Uh, biodynamic is like organic on steroids <clears throat> because you have to make tea preparations. The, uh, any type of sprays you're using can't have any chemical or any what, systemic chemicals. Well, systemic is conventional. <clears throat> organic has organic certified sprays. Like, um, I don't know about herbicides, but it's like pesticides and treatments. But a biodynamic, you're kind of making these things. You're not like buying them necessarily. I mean, you can buy tea preparations, but you're not like buying organic versions of, you know, herbicides and pesticides, right? Um, natural winemaking, that's more about the winemaking. So again, bio is about the farming practices, but the overarching bio, especially if you're getting certified, is usually uh, a whole property thing. And it's not, again, it's not necessarily the wine making, it's about the property. So you're, you're making preparations of tea, you're, you're burying the preparations into the soil with cow horns and then you're pulling it up and those, those are your sprays. You're using um, uh, compost piles. You, if you're really getting into it, you're, you're like Benziger, you're doing insectaries where you have insects help with your pest management. Um, you're using animals to help with like, um, you know, like 
weed control and stuff like that. And then, of course, you've got the moon and the stars and all that kind of stuff that I'm not being a, a former astronomer. I don't subscribe to the astrology aspect of things. But I also know that for millennia, we use the moon as our guide for farming. So there is a relation to that as far as timing and all that, but not necessarily like the pull of Jupiter is doing anything, right? Hey, I love the biodynamic stuff, but I think there's some people kind of go off the crazy or, or go off the deep end on it, but that's okay. The wines are good. Natural winemaking, they'll usually have some aspects of bio and or organic in their farming, but their winemaking practices are the least interventionist as possible. Um, the lazy way to say this is that natural winemaking is the laziest, dirtiest way to make wine. And the reason I say that is that because natural wine as a category has the most um, variation or the least stability of the wines. There are some outstanding natural wines out there and I love those wines for what they are. Um, I'm not saying for what they are, it's like because they taste funky. Like for what they are, for what they're trying to accomplish, they have some really good wines that that are that don't spoil and that taste good and all that. And you have some people that are just like again going off the deep end, and you get you get the wine, and one bottle is good, and the other bottle is just horrid, right? And there's spoilage and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, there's a balance. So sustainability. Sustainability encompasses not just the farming practices and not just the winemaking, but it encompasses how you run your business. And I think if you can do the sustainable stuff and maybe incorporate bio or at least organic, you know, farming, you're you're I think you're really hitting you're you're checking all the boxes, not for the sake of checking boxes, but you're really trying to do the best that you can and without like destroying the planet okay now does that mean that every winery needs to not use you know pesticides and herbicides and all that kind of stuff no there's some parts of the world that have been making wine for hundreds of years that need these treatments to be able to make a profit or to make you know make wine every year but i also know in talking to a lot of these people that they're not just like coating their stuff it's not like you know conventional farming where they're just spraying every week in, you know, the wheat and the cotton and the, in the soybeans and all that. Um, I mean, these guys, a lot of times they're living on the same property. So they, they're, they're using these products the least amount possible. Okay. Sorry, the soapbox. I shouldn't have really gone off that tangent. Um, I just, I kind of get excited about just, you know, wines, wineries that are using sustainable practices. Um, because I feel like they're really kind of doing an overall thing rather than just organic and bio. But I've gone to, especially some of the bio people, and they're also doing a lot of sustainable things in their winery. Okay. Um, all right, so let's get into the wine. So I got three wines here. The first one, I'm excited to try this. I'm really excited to try this. This is Pam's un -Oak Chardonnay from 2018. It has a California, um, a family owned in California, it says California in the back. Um, yeah, well, it says California because he sources grapes from out, probably maybe outside of Sonoma. It doesn't have a Sonoma um, appellation on it, so he may be getting some uh, grapes from other counties. Anyway, the unoaked is what I'm excited about. That is my preferred. That is my preferred expression of Chardonnay is the unoaked thing, and uh, I'm excited to try this. So Pam is his wife, and she wanted an unoaked chardonnay she's she's no fan of oaky chardonnay she asked for an unoaked version and reuben and his winemaker joe freeman put their heads together a year later pam's unoaked chardonnay which uh suggested retail is 14 dollars uh, came out and this was in 2011. so uh here's some characteristics of it it says no oak a relative a relatively modest level of alcohol at 12.5 percent and then um, I'm just going to read the rest. A mere hint, a mere hint of sweetness, and I'll get to that in a second. A barely there yet appealing touch of spritz. Um, plenty of sun, sunshine state fruit. So that kind of confirms that they, they get the fruit from a, a wide range of sources, which is fine because you can still get good quality, you know, 
uh, well-farmed fruit. All right, so um, in 2011, which is not quite 10 years ago, we still were in the midst of the oak monster, as Gary would say it, you know, the buttery, oaky Chardonnays. So um, that has, and around that time, things were starting to kind of be pulled back. So, you know, Pam, you know, thank you for being a, a, an earlier adopter of kind of restraining some things in Chardonnay. Hey, there's there's a reason, there, there's a place for super steely, flinty, Chablis style Chardonnay and the super oaky, buttery Chardonnay and everything in between. There's, there's a place for that, right? There's a place for everybody at the table. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave it at that. All right. Um because I'm hoping when this episode comes out, things are calming down. All right. Um, anyway, so, um, you know, it says alcohol levels for unoaked Chardonnays back in 2012 typically hovered around 13 and a half, which is not high. It's not, but it's, you know, somewhat elevated. Uh, such wines also tended to be more austere and higher priced. But uh, by contrast, this wine, it was laid back, fruit forward, fun, and about 14 bucks more uh so more affordable um so yeah they're they're trying to hit like a sweet spot not literally sweet like sugar but trying to sweet spot trying to find something that could have some really good appeal so let's see here so it said uh they had a lot of tinkering uh first step was sourced fruit from several different cool coastal vineyards all of which were were and remained family owned the next step was keeping that beautiful sunshine state fruit alive in the bottle so proportions between alcohol, acid, and sugar had to be just right. Uh, the winemaker says you get a rapid drop-off in fruit expression with higher alcohol. Fruit is dampened and sugar can come off as cloying rather than gently sweet. And so alcohol, as it goes up, gives you a higher appearance of sweetness, even if the sugar is dropping. Because the higher the alcohol, it should be the lower the sugar. In general, I mean, it depends if you're fully fermenting everything. So if you start off with a high sugar content, the the yeast can get you up to about 15% fairly well. The the current strains that we use can get you to 15% fairly, fairly easily. Um, if you're using strains that, that, that kind of peter out at lower alcohol levels, you can leave some residual sugar in there. Okay, or if you just have really, really ripe fruit, when you hit that 15-ish percent, there may be still some sugar left over, right? But if you ferment fully dry, so we're talking like four grams, three grams, two grams per liter left in the bottle, higher alcohol wines, and this is probably more applicable to red wine because red wine tends to have lusher and riper fruit flavors in general, especially at high, with higher alcohol, they taste sweeter, even if the exact, you think they have the same exact sugar content as say like, say you're going to like a 15% wine and versus a 14% wine. They may have the exact same sugar content left over, but the 15% wine will taste sweeter most of the time. All right. So, um, so, but of course you need alcohol for structure and round mouthfeel. So then they were trying to hit a sugar target. And this is like baking when a cake when a cake removed from a hot oven continues to cook, the same is true of fermenting grapes. I didn't, well, I didn't necessarily know that. It makes sense because if you're trying to stop the fermentation, uh, if you're trying to cool things, if you're trying to let things cool naturally or whatever, it's like, a, you know, same thing with baking, same thing with steak. You cook a steak like, say, mid-rare, and but it's still like, it's still cooling down. It may go up a, half temp to a full temp to like medium on the plate. So that can happen. Um, so yeah. Um, anyway, so it's easier to make a bone dry. So it's easier to make a bone dry wine. And then uh, for Joe, the final inspiration was bottling the wine in order to preserve a virtually undetectable bit of spritz. You don't notice it, but without it, the wine is a bit flat. So what they're trying to do is have a touch of CO2 left in there which um, can either be like maybe a little bit of a, this barest hint of maybe some bottle fermentation still going on. 
um, or that they're trying to keep or they're, or they're the way they're fermenting it and they're, they're keeping it in say, um, like stainless steel and they're not letting all the CO2 leave. So, so they're leaving a little bit of CO2 that's dissolved in there and then they bottle it. Um, you find that sometimes with Vino Verde or Vino Verde wines. Um, also screw caps tend to have a touch of CO2 left in there. When you open a screw cap and you pour the wine, you can sometimes see a little bit of bubbles. Now, there's bubbles in here. Now, that, that they said they have a little bit of CO2 left in here. Um, I did use Corvin, so Corvin also is injecting argon gas. So when you Corvin wine into a glass, you can still get some little bit of bubbles, okay? But if I had, if I just opened it and poured it in there, that happens a lot with uh, screw caps. It's another hint for your deductive tasting. Um, no little trick to the trade. When you see that, you go, okay, these wines are probably only come, coming from maybe a couple countries. Um, there are some screw caps in the old world, but it's more of a new world thing, especially Australia and New Zealand. However, um, you can also get that in Austria, with especially like Gruner and some Rieslings, like not high, high end stuff. Germany can do that because it, it keeps a freshness to the wine too. Um, let's see. And yeah. Now they do say drinking the wine at refrigerator temperature to maintain the energy. Well, you know I'm drinking these like room temperature because I can better evaluate the wine. All right. So let's, let's get into it. So it's not an overly fruity wine. It's not highly aromatic, but there's a little bit of aromatics to it. I would call it more golden apple. I mean, a little apple skin to it. Yeah, apple is definitely the driving force, and it's, it's a yellow or golden apple. And that's really all I'm getting, but obviously no oak, which I'm a big fan of. Another hint with blind tasting that can, can really narrow the grapes down is um, if you see like a bit of green in there, um, that can one kind of speak to youthfulness. But Chardonnay is one of the grapes that tends to have a bit of green color from, in the juice from the, what limited skin contact there is and all that. So back to the wine. So I can tell that there is a little bit of lushness to it. Um, I can see where that there's maybe a touch of extra residual sugar than you would normally have. Um, it tastes kind of like a sweeter apple. So there's like those apple crisp, or is that what it's called? Apple crisp or crisp apple or something like that. Um, honey, honey crisp or whatever. Is there a crisp, some type of crisp variety. Um, but this is more of a golden version of that, right? but it's really dominant as far as the apple flavor. There's a crispness to it, a crispness to it. There's an acidity to it. So my mouth is watering. So this is definitely, you know, something that I, they don't talk about malolactic and I feel like it really isn't going through any malolactic. So there's no creamy mouthfeel or creamy or buttery. And that's really more from some other fermentation stuff. Um, but I don't get this butteriness. I don't get this creaminess. I don't get the, the softness out of it. There's a crisp and refreshing and brightness to it. I wouldn't confuse it with Chablis because I also don't get a lot of like lime and green apple. So there's a ripeness to the fruit, but they're making sure that they don't have fruit that's probably really ripe to get you to that 14 and 14 and a half percent Chardonnay, which you can easily do in California. Um, I mean, granted, they're talking about cooler climate stuff, so it makes it, keeps that fruit restrained. Um, it's definitely refreshing. 
fourteen dollars is is I don't remember if I said that fourteen bucks. It was already in the lower third, but fourteen dollars is definitely a good price for this. I like the wine. I like it that I don't feel like I bit into a creamsicle, right? Orange, vanilla, you know, just out the wazoo type of thing, right? I'm like, even, even like the in-betweens, like a little bit of oak, you know, that's okay. And a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of creaminess, a little bit of butteriness, you know, none of that. It's really an apple driven wine with good acidity and zero oak. Yeah, I like the wine. I like the wine a lot. All right, let's move on to the next wine. So this wine will have some oak. So I'm excited because I get to use I get to use um, my extra Coravin uh, caps because I only had the two for a while, and then I bought a, a six pack and I hadn't really used them yet. All right, so this is the and if I didn't say the the year this oh yes eighteen this is also 2018. So this is the Russian River Valley uh, Chardonnay. So you should be able to see that pretty well. Now that I've figured out how to do all my exposures and everything, uh, things are going really good. Oh, actually, I didn't really adjust it, but I guess the, the camera just adjusted really well to it. All I did was just make sure it was zoomed in well enough, but everything looks, the exposure looks great on that. The colors are looking good. <clears throat> I'm really not worried about the uh, shutter speed because I'm not worried about having a cinematic look anymore. I'm shooting at 30 frames per second and I'm not worried about the shutter speed. I thought about doing 60 frames per second, but there's there's a reason why I'm shooting at 30 for, for this set of reviews. Um, and that's a potential episode of Behind the Scenes, which is my other channel that I started a few months ago. <clears throat> so if you're interested in how I make the videos go check out that other one i should probably always have a link to that channel all right um so russian river valleys assets are well known to wine lovers pacific ocean fog and cool breezes traveling inland through the petaluma gap i've already mentioned that uh combined with generous sunshine we have diurnal shifts of uh 35 to 40 degrees so that's the diurnal shift that's you know you get the difference between the highest temperature in the day and the lowest temperature at night so if you get a 35 to 40 degree spread, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're getting the sugars, your sugars go up, and then when it cools down, your acid goes up. So you're retaining sugar and acid instead of like just hot, 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 and then warm, and your acids don't really ever go up. So it's more sugar, 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 and then you just get like, you know, just like a, a high alcohol wine that's got a little bit of fruit to it, right? All right. Um, anyway. So let's see here. Assets more specific to the Green Valley include its Gold Ridge soil and less abrupt temperature shifts during uh, the 24 hour cycle. Gold Ridge soil is a sandy loam, roughly 60% sand, 10% clay, and 30% silt. So they have 2.5 acres of Chardonnay and 6.5 and acres of Pinot Noir. Um, and just as in Burgundy, you use fruit from various high quality pockets to make your wine. So that's, that's another thing. So people like to talk about I have a state fruit. My wine is therefore better than somebody else's. And I, I I don't ever do this, but I feel like going, so have you ever been to Burgundy? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other. It's just that if someone's trying to say that it's superior because of something, it's not necessarily the case. And that works out with a lot of things in life. Again, hopefully all the craziness is calming down a little bit, but I don't have any hope for that. Um, sorry. It's kind of hard not to interject some of these things right now. Um, cause it's, remember this is June 22nd or this is June 23rd for me right now. And you're probably watching this in August or the end of July. All right. Um, I got distracted. Sorry. And that's why, yeah, I got distracted. All right, so in the process, uh, you turn a potentially disadvantage into an advantage. Indeed, a triumph, as they say. 
All right, so uh, a lot of, mi a lot of uh, micro terroirs, cooler in the south due to dependent on the gap, warmer further inland. Temperature variations due to altitude and the coastal mountains and riverbank terroirs, thank you to the Russian River itself and its many tributaries. Surprising fact, according to Joe, uh, their head, Joe Freeman, their head winemaker, um, counterintuitively, it is warmer at the top of the hills. Well, hello, little flying bug. There. Been, it's been flying around. Um, it's warm at the top of the hills, not cooler as in Burgundy, because the fog doesn't always reach the top of those hills. Um, let's see. We'll skip ahead because let's get into what they do. So the Chardonnay, this Chardonnay uses three different clones. I won't go through the clones, but the three different clones, um, because they are consistently productive and set fruit uniformly, Dijon clones are added for Burgundian style and add complexity. So they have three clones for one aspect, and they have some Dijon clones or Burgundian clones. Um, Grapes are hand-picked in whole cluster press without, without a cold soak to, per, to preserve acidity and avoid extracting tannins. After fermentation, six months, six plus months of barrel aging ensues with a post-bottling rest of another six months or so. All right, so now they, then they get into like what the wine tastes like. All right, so let's check it out. So there's more color to this. So I wish I had left the other wine in there, which there's a little bit of red wine from here, so I'll, I'll just leave it. So that color comes from uh, the oak and then the aging process too, because the oak allows oxygen. So you get some oxidation. Oh, it's only six months, but the oak also imparts a little bit of color to it. There's still some green in it, so it's, it's young and it's a Chardonnay. Remember, there's other grapes besides Chardonnay that can have green, but that should be one of the grapes you go, I see green. It's only a couple of grapes that are going to really have green that we're testing on. So there's definitely a richer aroma to this. Um, it's definitely pomaceous fruit, so it's mostly apple, a touch of pear. Um, but you also get uh, some of that oak characteristics, so a touch of vanilla, a touch of caramel. Um, I don't get anything like buttery or anything like that. Um, I don't get like a buttered popcorn thing or a popcorn at all, which I didn't get from the other wine, which can happen a lot with Chardonnay. From what I understand, it's most likely due to an anaerobic environment during fermentation. I've had people say it's from hot fermentation, but um, the thinking, the last visit I made to some winers when I asked the question is when there's um, no oxygen, so when you get this um, reductive winemaking, it can, the, the burnt popcorn and the popcorn thing is kind of a sulfurous um, aroma. So, yeah, there's like a richness to the fruit. There's, there's like a, almost like a baked apple, which is somewhat like a oxidized thing, an oxidation thing. Oh, wow, there's like a cinnamon to it, too. It was like a cinnamon apple crunch. Yeah. Wow, that was kind of cool. Yeah, I know this is my first style of Chardonnay, but like I can appreciate oaked Chardonnays, and this doesn't sound like it's like heavily oaked anyway. The oak is absolutely there. Is it a crap ton of oak? No. I mean, if they're doing 100% new French oak or new oak, I'm really impressed because it's super well integrated. My feeling is, it is hard. I mean, I, I don't know how to actually judge percentage, but my feeling is this under 50, 50, 50 percent uh, new oak, and then the rest is at least one or two or three use oak because they don't they don't specify how much oak but there's definitely oak in it i kind of feel like it's maybe a little maybe 50 percent is probably all right all 
There's a higher ripeness level of the fruit. There's definitely a baked apple. There's a roundness to it. So I feel like there probably was a little bit of mallow lactic going on here. Um, may not be 100% mallow, maybe just like a partial mallow, which I think that's a really good way to make Chardonnay. Like a little bit of French, I'm not French, a little bit of new oak, a little bit of mallow. It doesn't have to be 100% of either, but a good combination. You know, depending on your fruit, maybe you have to have a higher level, maybe you have to have a lower level. But there's a little bit of caramel. Um, there's, yeah, a little bit of roundness. I wouldn't say called creaminess, but there's there's a there's a, a broadness to it, um, a lowering of acid. Um, my mouth isn't watering as much as it is with this one, right? So that means we're going from a from malic acid um, to lactic acid, and lactic acid is a perceived as a lower acid than malic. Tartaric is the high is the main acid of grapes, but there's malic acid also and a couple other acids, and then malic malolactic fermentation converts the malic acid to Lactic acid that gives you that creamy, buttery, not buttery, but that creamy, um, softer mouthfeel. Yeah. It's a it's a good one. Oh, it's 20 bucks retail, which was already in the lower third. I think it's a I think it's a definitely a well-priced wine. I've had wines of this caliber that are more expensive. I've had wines of this caliber that are less expensive, but you know. 20 bucks is a really good, like, kind of in-between price point. I mean, you could probably sell this for more and not, like, not bad an eye. Like, I could probably sell it and be, like, totally comfortable with getting more money from this wine. I would call this wine on the richer side of the midpoint of the full-on oaky and buttery Chardonnay and the the Chablis style, you know, with steely, flinty, lean, almost Pinot Grigio like. I would put this in the kind of the closer to the higher higher levels uh, on the mid range. It's a good wine, good wine. I think I like this one a little bit better, but I could totally drink this one. I mean, I'm I'm definitely gonna drink it. All right, let's put that off to the side so I don't put red wine in it. Let's get this done. Uh, 2017 Ron Rubin Russian River Valley Pinot Noir. Um, retail, suggests retail is 25 bucks. So uh, it's mostly made from Green Valley fruit. And um, let's see here. They use open top fermenters. Their greater surface area enables grape skins to spread out, thereby increasing extraction. Due to the outstanding quality of the fruit, the wine was aged 20% in new French oak, which is fairly Burgundian in style. Um, yeah. Doesn't say for how long, but unlike Bordeaux, Burgundy doesn't use generous amounts of new oak for the most part. I mean, I'm sure you can find some examples of Pinots and Chardonnays that have a lot of new oak, maybe even 100% new oak, but in general, they're in that under 50% for sure, closer to that 30-ish percent or so. All right. That's what Pinot Noir is supposed to look like. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a bit of, hold on. It's kind of hard to tell. You'd have, I'd have to have a top down, which I'm not going to do right now. Maybe I should do that. Have it, have an episode about Pinot Noir comparative. Hey, I have a at some point this year I'm going to be doing a Cabernet California Cabernet comparative, and hopefully I don't piss too many people off because I'm going everything from ten bucks to two hundred fifty bucks blind. All right, so um, I'll have to admit that. I didn't talk about it because I didn't. I didn't want to paint myself into a corner from what I said. Um, was it earlier today, earlier in this episode, or maybe another episode about what Pinot Noir should look like? But um, they talked about. Um, let's get the 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 document I'm using. It doesn't scroll very nice. Um, it's on. It's online. 
So let's see if I can find this where they kind of talk about Pinots. Let's see here. It says differences in terroirs are more important with Pinot Noir than for Chardonnay. They were talking about depending on where you get the Pinot, certain parts of the area gives you more concentration of color in the Pinot. And I read that and I was like, please don't have this look like some other well-known Pinots that look like Cabernet. And it doesn't, so good job, guys. All right, so um, definitely red-fruited. There's um, kind of this cherry, not quite cherry cola, but there's a cherry, definitely a bright Bing cherry um, aroma to it. I guess cola nut. Yeah. There's also a touch of plum to it. It smells really clean though. So like it's got 20% French oak. Like it doesn't taste, it doesn't smell like, like really a lot of oak, right? It's really restrained. It's really fresh smelling, like bright, youthful. Um, it's mostly just cherry. Um, yeah, touch of, a touch, like the, the, the hintest, the barest hint of like, like a very lightly chocolate covered cherry, but and a little bit darker on the cherry, but it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's cherry, a little strawberry, touch of earth, touch of like little, like woodsy wood, wood itself, not necessarily vanilla type of thing, but like, you know, just like, um, like a wooden box, not quite cedar box, cigar box, but yeah. Maybe a little fern to it. Yeah, there's, 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 there's a, there's a green, not like pepper, like, like, not like bell pepper green, not like mint and tarragon, but like a, like a leafy quality to it. And just clean. All right. Like I would not confuse this with burgundy because burgundy doesn't necessarily, well, no, some burgonias, like just like, you know, burgonia Appalachian ones can smell like this. This would kind of confuse me because I wouldn't, I wouldn't know where to take it initially on the nose. I wouldn't know where if I should take it to burgundy, like, you know, burgonia, not like village level, but burgonia or to California, right? Um, it doesn't have enough earthiness and spice component for me to go, hey, this might be Oregon. And I don't do enough New Zealand, but New Zealand is very similar to Oregon, um, but maybe closer to the fruitier side. You know, like Anderson Valley Pinot from Cali because Anderson Valley is kind of like that in between Oregon and like typical Cali. Let's taste it. It's definitely easy drinking. It's good. Um, it's not my favorite expression of Pinot, and, and that's just because most California Pinot is just not my favorite expression. With that said, I think it's a really well-made Cali Pinot. I think it will appeal to a ton of people. It's very close to the Cali style I absolutely do like. It, it's more on that fruit side, but there's a tartness to the fruit. So like I could totally take this at Burgundy and I think that's where, you know, I kind of like that. I kind of like that Burgundian style or side of Pinot, not the really fruit and jammy and extracted Pinots that people love. Um, so I'm not a fan of it. Um, this is not one of those Pinots. So this is a Pinot I totally could drink and I would totally enjoy it. And if I'm going to split hairs, I, I like Oregon better. Um, there's uh, some other Cali Pinots I, I personally like better, but I definitely like this better than the vast majority of Cali Pinots. 
So it's got a touch of the bitterness, a touch of, of dryness to the fruit, but the fruit is still there. It's still kind of saying, hey, I'm, I'm new world, brother. I mean, I might be cool climate, but I'm still kind of the new world here. I'm not, I'm not full on burgundy. We're just kind of like emulating that style. We're kind of showing what burgundy might look like in say another five or 10 years, you know, with global warming, right? Still a restrained style, but the fruit's gonna start showing through a little bit more. There's a black tea, not kind of kind of like a, a slightly watered down iced tea, um, unsweet. That's the way I drink it. I can even see putting a little, not, not that I would put lemon in this, but I could kind of see adding some lemon to it just to kind of spice it up. But I'm digressing, which I always do. Um, yeah, a little black tea to it. Um, drier earth, not like a wet forest mushroomy earth, like a drier earth to it. A um, little tree bark to it. And, and the wood is, the oak is really restrained. Like it's just, it's just there to kind of add a little bit, not quite sweetness. And I really even have said, really said the word vanilla yet because it's not prominent. It It's, it's just kind of like this hint of there's a richness to it, but it's not as over the top like I'm using a ton of new oak and I'm spending a, a crap ton of money and you need to recognize that, right? Which would also mean that the wine would be way more expensive. <clears throat> There's a restraint to it. And this is, again, this is what I would like California Pinot in general to be like. Um, I do like it. Yeah, and there's this like something else on the nose. It's, it's a pleasant smell. There's some dried flour to it. There's a little bit of spice, like just a touch of spice. Like if I, so this is one of those where you stick your nose in it, you're like, it's Pinot Noir. Sometimes when you put your nose in something, you're like, is it Gamay? Is it Grenache? Is it Pinot? Like you're doing, you're doing that, not, it's not a triangle because it they're, they're right in line north to south, Pinot, Gamay. Grenache, but you're like in that that kind of death loop of the three of the three red grapes from France, and because you're thinking, is it one of these three, and is it from France? This I wouldn't go. Oh, what is that? You know, is it? No, I'd be like it's Pinot, and then it's kind of like, well, where am I? Am I really in Burgundy? Is this Burgonia? Is this maybe you know a little bit warmer climate Burgundy? Maybe a, maybe a little bit warmer vintage, but not like hot. Or is this California? I'm like, ah, probably not New or probably not Oregon, probably not New Zealand. You know, I mean, I think it's a well-made wine. It's not meant to be confusing on purpose. It's just like, I think it really expresses the grape the way it should be expressed. It lets the grape express itself. Let's put it that way. Instead of like trying to <clears throat> force a winemaking style on it. Which I think somewhere in all the notes, they're like, they're not trying to force a style. It's good. I probably should reach out to these guys for a Skype interview. I've been doing a lot more Skype interviews. I actually sent out a bunch of emails today. Hopefully get more Skype interviews because now all you wineries can do this. Before, be like, well, we're not really tech savvy and we don't know how to do it. Well, now all you guys, now you have to know. You have to have, you have to go, oh yeah, I got a camera in my, in my uh, webcam, my laptop, and there's a thing called Zoom, which I Zoom sucks. Um, I mean, for interviews, it sucks. Zoom is fine for, you know, group stuff, but I still think Skype's better. But yeah. Anyway, you should buy the wine. I like it. I think my favorite is still the Un Oak Chardonnay. The cheapest of the lot, too. I love when it's the cheapest wine. Or the least expensive. I don't... We're cheap really has negative connotations. Value, least expensive. They're all good wines. I'll, I'll drink all of them happily. All right, so how do you want to help me out now that I'm helping everybody else out? Click like. Click the like button. Click the subscribe button. You tell your friends about it. Um, if you're on iTunes or any other place that has podcasts and you can give me a good rating, you know, five-star, whatever, nice review, that'd be great. Um, there's a PayPal link in the description uh, below. You can uh, also, if you want to check out any of the equipment I typically use, I got some Amazon affiliate links there. You can click the links above also to friend me up. And um, 
yeah, that's going to do it. And we'll see everyone again next time.